Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Haley McCalla from CDC's Office of Public Health Preparedness and Response, Division of Emergency Operations, and I'd like to welcome you to today. Um, today's webinar for Crisis and Emergency Risk Communication titled Psychology of a Crisis. Today, we will hear from CDC's Kelly Waters, who is a Senior Health Communication Specialist. If you do not wish for your participation to be recorded at this time, please exit. You can earn continuing education for completing this webinar. Please follow the instructions on our website, which is also linked in the invitation you received. The course access code is CERC0605 with all letters capitalized. To repeat, the course access code to receive continuing education is in all caps CERC 0605. Today's webinar is interactive. To make a comment, click the chat button on your screen and then enter your thoughts. To ask a question, please use the Q&A button on your screen. The Q&A session will begin after Kelly has presented. We'll now transition to our presentation. Kelly Waters currently supports the Emergency Risk Communication Branch, which oversees the CERC program. Kelly has over 15 years experience in public health communication. She has provided communication support during emergency responses to H1N1, Ebola, Zika, the 2017 hurricane season, and others. Previously, she served as an editor, media liaison, and public information officer to internal and external partners, including congressional correspondents. She currently leads the CERC program and has conducted numerous national and international trainings on the subject matter. Thank you for joining us today, Kelly. Please begin. Hello, everyone. Uh, as Haley said, I am Kelly Waters, and I will be doing your training today. Um, last time we did a webinar, we did the introduction to CERC, and I'm going to cover just a little bit about the introduction for a second so that we can transition into the psychology of a crisis. When we did the introduction, we talked about the six principles of CERC. The six principles of CERC are be right, be first, be credible, express empathy, promote action, and show respect. That's what CERC is. If you'd like to listen to that particular webinar that is posted on our, on our website, which is where this webinar also will be posted and you can and you can catch up on what CERC is. So now we're going to go into the psychology of a crisis, which is the why, why CERC matters, why it's important. We're going to talk now a little bit about the psychology of a crisis in terms of Oops. Hold on one second, guys. I'm going to try and share my screen with you. And we're going to break it down into um, the psychology, communication in a crisis, how to use, how to understand the psychology in terms of communication, how to understand people's perception of risk, and how to incorporate that into actions. Then as Haley said, we're gonna do some Q&A. So any questions you have as I'm, as I'm just talking about psychology of a crisis, please make notes of them. Feel free to go ahead and put them in the comments in the chat boxes, and we'll discuss them at the end of the presentation. CERC, again, we discussed this in the first webinar, but to reiterate, CERC principles can help you provide the public with information that helps them make the best decisions that they can within incredibly challenging time constraints and to accept the imperfect nature of choice. So basically, CERC is helping people do the best they can with the information they have in incredibly challenging situations. But the idea behind CERC, the idea behind this, this curriculum, the idea behind communication in emergencies is that the right message at the right time from the right person can save lives. Psychology comes in 
with CERC, not as a means of mass therapy, okay? We're not trying to individually treat everyone and how they feel in an emergency. What we're trying to do is help people deal with the crisis and adapt to the situation so that we can help them cope in the best and safest way possible. People feel a lot of different things in an emergency. Some people feel denial. Some people have a hard time accepting that, that an emergency has even happened. They have a hard time embracing the reality of the situation. Fear is also a natural reaction. They feel a lot of anxiety, confusion, and, and dread. People feel hopelessness, the, the sense that no one can do anything to, to remedy the situation, and they feel helplessness, the sense that there's nothing that they can do. The point of CERC is not to remove what people feel, but to help them cope with these feelings, to, to give them a sense that, that things can be done to address the situation. Panic in CERC is called a myth because panic the way that Hollywood movies, for example, define it. Um, if, if, you, if you can picture for a moment people running through the streets screaming and, and um, doing, doing things that don't make sense, taking actions that are counterintuitive to their, to their well-being, to their health, um, that, that's not typically in, in emergency experience how people react. People do what makes sense to them based on their experiences, based on what they've been through before, based on what people around them are doing, and based on the information they have. So they, they react to a situation based on what makes sense to them and based on what they know to do. Okay, so if something looks like panic, if behavior looks like panic to communication professionals, it's because people may not have the information that we have. So if we want them to react differently, if we want them to behave differently, we need to provide them with different information. We need to provide them with information that guides them towards different behaviors. Not providing any information at all will lead them to do whatever they know to do, again, based on wherever they can get good information, wherever they can get guidance. And it may not be good information. It may be, it may be whatever they can, they can reach out and find. So it's our job as communicators to provide them the kind of, the kind of guidance that they need in an emergency situation that they can rely on to keep themselves safe and healthy. So what does that look like? What is, what is, what is communicating in a crisis actually look like if we're trying to keep psychology in mind? People are gonna to tend to simplify messages. So when we are talking to people in a crisis, they're getting information from they're getting information from the news. They're getting information from their family and friends. They're getting information from their, um, from their employers. They're getting information from their local shop owners. They're getting information from their neighbors. They're getting information from everywhere. So imagine yourself in their shoes. You're getting information from all of these different sources and you're only able to retain a fraction of that information, okay? So, for example, from the CDC perspective, if we want to share a public health message, we don't want to share a very long public health message because they're getting messages from everyone, from everywhere. So we want to share our message in as short and as simple of terms as possible so that hopefully they can remember that message. Hopefully that message can be repeated multiple times so that, so that it can be retained, okay? People also hold on to current beliefs. And what, what I mean by that is that people 
retain what they know. They, they retain what they've been through before. They retain experiences. They retain, um, they retain their cultural beliefs. They retain all kinds of things that they, their life experiences. Um, so we need to be aware of that and we need to speak in terms of those beliefs. People look for additional information and opinions. They, they look for second opinions, right? So if we're telling people to evacuate in a situation, if, if say um, FEMA is asking people to leave their homes before a storm, people might look outside and see if the neighbors are packing their bags, right? They might call local family members and see what they're doing before they uproot their lives. It's, it's entirely reasonable that people look for second opinions in these situations. People also tend to believe the first message they hear, and this gets back to one of the CERT principles about being first. We need to try to get out there as quickly as we can with our messaging. There's also a tendency for people to react to, to our messages, I'm sorry, there's a tendency for people to react to the situation, whether in, in proportion or disproportionately to the actual hazard. So we say that risk perception equals the hazard, the actual scientific measure of the event, plus the outrage, the emotional measure. measure. Now, when we say outrage, a lot of people think, anger, outrage, but we're talking any emotion. Um, outrage can be anxiety, it can be fear, it can be any emotion in this, in this definition of outrage, okay? When we're talking about perceptions of risk, we're talking about different types of risk, okay? And certain risks are perceived differently. You've got voluntary risks versus involuntary risks. Um, things that are controlled personally versus things that are controlled by others. For example, if you go skydiving and you fall out of the airplane and you open your parachute a little too late and you break your leg, you have a broken leg. That's the outcome. If you go walking across the street and you wait for the crosswalk signal and you get hit by a car and you break your leg, you also have a broken leg. Same exact outcome. However, the circumstances are different and one may be a bit higher outrage than the other. If you think about going parachuting and breaking your leg, well, you might be more willing to accept ownership over that broken leg than if someone hits you with their car and breaks your leg for you, right? So the outrage in that situation is just a little bit higher, even though the risk is exactly the same, the scientific measure. When I talk about familiar versus exotic, so when we talk about familiar risk, the flu season comes around every year. Some flu seasons actually are maybe a little bit more severe. But when we ask people, how are you feeling in the fall? Sometimes people say, oh, I have the flu. Even if they don't, even if they just have a cold, because it's something familiar versus exotic. Ebola, when Ebola was happening and, and came to the United States was extremely exotic and there was a lot of concern around its entry into the United States because it's not something we're very familiar with. Things that are natural like hurricanes and tornadoes versus things that are man-made, like bombs, have a tendency to really up the quotient of outrage. Um, I won't go through each and every one of these, but things that are affect adults tend to have less of an outrage factor than things that affect children. Very important to point those out. Things that affect children often bring a lot of emotion. Where things that affect adults, we feel like we can cope a little bit better independently, that we can resolve issues on our own. 
Why does this matter to communication? Well, it matters because it affects our behaviors, right? So in a situation, for example, bioterrorism attack with anthrax in your area, if I were to say, is this high outrage or low outrage? And is this a high hazard or is this a low hazard? You might say it's a high hazard and it's a high outrage and you would probably be right. This is not a trick question, okay? A biohazard attack, an intentional attack in your area is dangerous and people would rightly be upset about this. The point of this is that you, you want these to match up. You won't break out this box and do this every single time you have an emergency, but in the back of your mind, you wanna consider this when you're communicating an emergency because you want these to match up. You want high hazard to have a high outrage because people will appropriately respond. They will be appropriately engaged in the situation and hopefully willing to take appropriate public health recommendations. And for a low hazard event, hopefully the outrage is low enough that people will, will be appropriately unconcerned, <laughs> meaning that they will, they will be aware of their risks and understand that they're not significant and won't be, won't be overly concerned, overly worried unnecessarily. However, when these two things don't match up, when they're, when they're unbalanced, that's where communications really comes in. So when there's a low hazard event, when the risk, the scientific risk isn't very high, but the outrage is, you need to educate people down. When the Fukushima reactors failed after the tsunami event, after the earthquake in Japan several years ago in 2011, People in the United States on the coast of California were actually extremely concerned about radiation exposure. They were, they were going to their doctor's offices, they were going to their local ERs, they were going to their hospitals, trying to access medication to treat radiation poisoning. The problem with that is that they were overwhelming healthcare systems. They were trying to get access to medications that they didn't need to take which overwhelmed, again, their healthcare systems, and they were potentially taking medicine that can be dangerous if you don't need to take it. That's bad. So with the hazard being low and the outrage high, there were actual physical and, and, and there were physical dangers to those individuals, but also dangers to the people who really needed those appointments, who really needed access to those medical facilities and those, and those healthcare providers. So that's when, that's when communications needs communicators to bring people down and educate them to, to what the real risks are. Now, when there's a high hazard and low outrage, so um, for example, when there's a high hazard and potentially um, people have, have lost their vigilance over, over a health outcome such as such as Ebola when when it's been going on for two years um, and 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 a community has has tired of of all of the risk avoidance having to educate people up having to having to help people understand that they still need to remain vigilant having to up their outrage is another task for communicators, having to make people more outraged. Um, and again, we're defining outrage not as anger, but as emotion, just helping people re-engage with, with the emergency. So what does that look like? What does that actually look like? in action. A huge part of CERC working depends on stakeholders trusting us 
as communicators. Stakeholders are going to judge our messages based on whether or not they can trust us. So when we say that we're going to do something, we need to do it. We need to follow through. When we don't follow through, we lose that trust. We lose our credibility, which is another CERC principle. Um, be credible. We have to make sure that when we say we're going to do something, that we do it which means not saying we're going to do something that we're not sure we can't follow through on. It's just as simple as that. There is a, again, in the introduction to CERC, um, a principle, it's, it's an outgrowth of one of the principles. It is not one of the principles in and of itself, but um, uh, under promise and over deliver. So under promise, say, say what you can certainly do and over deliver, do more. If, if and when you're able, always do more. The consequences of mistrust are that health recommendations are ignored. People will not take our message seriously. If they don't trust us, they, they will ignore the advice that we have to give. And if it's good advice, which hopefully what we're sharing is, then, then disease and death rates will go up. Um, resources will be um demanded that that people don't need as i used in the example of of radiation treatment that was unnecessary people will demand resources that they that they don't need they that will be misallocated um and and people will prey on those who are looking for information anywhere if they're not getting it from us which Hopefully, we're, we want to be the ones that are trusted. From the CDC's perspective, we definitely want to be trusted public health resource. Um, and, and, and what it really boils down to is that we can accomplish our mission. So we certainly want to make sure that in, in, building, um, in building on the psychology of a crisis, we really want to make sure that we're building a trust among the people that we're trying to communicate with so that we can accomplish our mission, which is ultimately to promote positive public health behaviors in an emergency. So how do we do that? This is, this is CERC in action. We wanna share information early. Again, these are the six principles of CERC. We wanna share information early, which is be first. We wanna acknowledge the concerns of others. This is, this is express empathy, okay? We wanna acknowledge the concerns of others in words. We wanna under promise and we wanna over deliver. This is being trustworthy. We want to select a spokesperson who is never condescending, someone that people can relate to. Um, if we have to, we want to engage third-party validators and advocates. This is, this is um, engaging the community, and this is, this, this is another webinar that we'll do, um, not the next webinar, but two webinars from now. We'll talk about community engagement. It's also really important that we allow people to feel the right I'm sorry, the right to feel fear. Um, it's not giving them permission. I don't mean it to sound like that. What we want to express here is that we're not doing mass psychology. We're not doing mass therapy. It's that we're communicators. We're not therapists. We're, we're not trying to make the fear go away. What we're trying to do is help people cope with the fear. Okay, so in an emergency, we're trying to help people manage the fear and behave in their health's best interest in spite of the fear. We don't want to over reassure. We don't want to say it's going to be okay. We don't know that it's going to be okay. Define okay. What does that even mean? Um, okay, how things were before. New okay. So let's stay away from those blanket statements and not over reassure. Acknowledging uncertainty again is expressing empathy, acknowledging what people are feeling, um, making sure to identify exactly what they're going through so that they understand that you understand. Giving people meaningful things to do is another CERC principle. Promote action, help them help themselves. 
by, by allowing them to participate in their own recovery. And this is important. When the news is good, state continued concern before stating reassurance. What this looks like is, while we still need everyone to continue to cover their cough and wash their hands, we are seeing a reduction in cases of the flu. That's just an example, but what that basically looks like is stating the continued public health action, stating the continued vigilance that needs to be taken before stating the progress. Because if you state the progress first, people often stop there. If you hear we're seeing a reduction in the number of cases of flu, people hear it's going away. They don't hear we still have to be careful. So make the priority the public health response and then follow with the good news. And be aware that in the CERC rhythm, people's emotions, people's outrage is going to evolve just as the CERC rhythm does. The CERC rhythm is something we discussed in the introduction to crisis and emergency risk communication. So in the first webinar that we did in this series, and I'm bringing it back to you again with psychology of a crisis. During the preparation phase, people are often not outraged at all, right? Because nothing has happened. This is when people are considering what could happen. This is when they're, you know, they're doing preparation in case something happens. Right when a crisis happens in the initial phase of an emergency, this is when all of those emotions, the fear, the anxiety, perhaps the denial, the hopelessness, the helplessness, all of those all of those barriers, those psychological barriers come into play. The maintenance phase is when some other emotions start to emerge. Things like anger and blame um, begin to, to block our ability to accept messaging. Um, so we need to evolve with people's psychological evolution as well. Resolution phase might also be sometimes a good opportunity to resolve our, our psychological differences with, with a community, um, educating and, and adapting our messaging and adapting future plans. If, if something was done right, um, making that a standard for future, for future events, and if something was done wrong, trying to, trying to figure out how to fix that and make it better moving forward. So, Understanding how people's psychology affects their ability to hear our messages, to retain our messages, and their willingness to act on our messages matters during an emergency. This is the why of CERC, okay? That's the point of the psychology of a crisis. Again, it's not to make these emotions go away, it's to help people make the best decisions they can in spite of how they're feeling about the situation. And that is the end of the actual presentation. Um, I'm going to go back to Haley and let her start with the questions and answers. Thank you so much for that wonderful presentation, Kelly. We will transition into the Q&A session. So if you do have a question, please click the Q&A button that is on your screen and then type in your thoughts and then uh, we'll go ahead and get Kelly to answer that. Um, as of right now, we already have a few questions. So Monica, can you go ahead and read the first one? Sure, thanks Haley. We have some great questions here. Uh, first one up, Kelly, can you give an example of a panic behavior? I'm trying to think of a good example of a panic behavior. Um, and I really need to have one because people always ask. But it would be doing something dramatic, you know, something counterintuitive to your 
health. Um, in an emergency. So, so stopping. Um, actually, I'm going to defer this one to my colleague. Uh, type it in then. I'm going to defer this one to my colleague who is actually um, trying to chime in to this. She's, she's sitting in the room and she has a good example in mind while I'm defining it. Um, but I, I'll keep defining it and then let her read, let Monica read that out. When, when people do a pan, have a panic behavior, it's something counterintuitive to their health. Um, and, and basically what that looks like is making a decision that is, and actually I just saw something from Sean to all the panelists driving into floodwaters as a panic behavior. Yes. So just making a decision that is just trying to get out, just trying to, just trying to do something that is completely counter to what you're being advised to do um, because you don't have better information, because you don't know what else to do, because it's based on you think you think it's the best course of action without having any other sense of better behavior. Um, but if Kate has typed this in, maybe Monica can read it. Okay. So, so yes, Sean read, wrote driving to floodwaters, which is one. And I think Monica is going to read Kate's example, who is my um, other colleague in CERC. Okay. Uh, yes, the example that Kate gave was if you are driving and freeze at a train track. That was the example she provided. Yeah. So driving into floodwaters and driving and freeze on a train track. So there's that whole fight or, fight or flight um, sense of being. But often people in an emergency are able to take actions. They often don't have that tension if they're given the right guidance. So that's why in CERC, that's why it's called a myth in CERC, okay? It's, it's called, not because people don't exhibit it, it happens sometimes, but because more often than not, it has been experienced that if given the right steps, given the right actions and promoted correctly, people will be able to take information, good, positive, promoted actions, and act on them. Does that make sense? Hopefully. Great. Thanks, Kelly. Uh, one more question here. It says, uh, this is from Anonymous, when there is uh, a high hazard and a low outrage, what is an effective way to increase engagement without causing panic? So the way that we do it at CDC, the way that we do it with our messaging is just to keep repeating our, our messages, just to keep promoting our messages. Um, we try not to, we try not to, um, re, you know, up our tone or, you know, add warning signs and bells and whistles or anything like that. It's just to continue to promote, to continue to repeat, to continue to reiterate and, and to try to get them out through other channels, to try to get them out through more channels, to try to get them out through um, to, to additional audiences. We try to really make sure we're targeting audiences as best we can. Um, myself and I, I mentioned my, my colleague Kate, when we are not working on CERC specifically, our team, the Emergency Partners Information Connection, uh, EPIC, we, we work with um, our, our colleagues to identify audiences that have specific needs, hard of hearing audiences. Um, we are partnering with, with organizations like Meals on Wheels, you know, so that we can, we can make sure that these audiences who don't have necessarily access to um, major media outlets or, you know, general population outlets, are getting the information that they need, the specialized information that they need and the formats that they need it in. So, um, you know, really making sure that we're hitting everyone that may need the information and the guidance and the messaging and the directions 
that they need in the, in the formats, in the ways that they need to receive it. Um, just repeating it, just repeating it, just repeating it. And that's why when I said simplifying the messages, next, next webinar, we'll talk about messages and audiences, which is talking about how to do this. So we talk about what Circ is and about why it's important. And the next time we're going to talk about um, how a little bit to do this. Um, and, and it's so important to make these messages short and simple and repeatable so that eventually they just stick. Um, you know, the, the best, the best messaging, the best messaging ever in the entire world is the flu messaging, cover your cough, wash your hands, right? And it's really, really hard to make all messages like that. It's really, really, really hard to make them all that short and simple and memorable, but that's what we shoot for. And, um, and if we can, if we can get them like that, if we can get them that easy to remember and repeat, then hopefully other people can keep spreading those messages for us. Great, thanks so much for that answer, Kelly. Um, we have a question here and it states, what are some ways to develop trust uh, in an emergency or disaster situation? I mean, the best ways to build trust, hmm. the best ways to build trust are to do it prior to this, emergency ever starting, really. Um, you know, I, sh I showed you the, the circ rhythm and in the initial phase, that's when you really want to be building those relationships and be building those, um, building up that credibility. So um, if you have, if you have uh, social media outlets, that's when you really want to be building that following and promoting your agency as a trustworthy source of information. Um, it's it's really the time before an emergency that you want to be promoting yourself as as a source of of that type of information so that when an emergency happens people know to come to you um, but during an emergency the best way to maintain that sort of um, credibility and and trustworthiness is to be very very quick to be very very quick to be available with information, um, to be um, hopefully right about your information. But if th this gets back to, again, the, the previous webinar, the introduction to CERC, but if you're not right, if for some reason you make a mistake or, you know, based on the information you have, you release information and then you find out that the information you released is wrong, being very, very quick to correct that information um, with new information. Um, being empathetic, you know, not being, um, we, we, from my perspective, so my person, from our perspective as the CDC, not being the CDC, but being, being person, being we, because we, we are people as well. We, we people work at CDC and we people are trying to help other people. So, um, being empathetic, using the strict principles, um, that's, that's how you maintain that trust and, and being respectful. That's how you, you build that credibility and that's how you maintain that credibility and trustworthiness. Great, thanks so much, Kelly. Uh, one attendee here would like you to elaborate a little more on collective panic behavior. Can you give some examples um, as to what that is? On collective panic behavior? Yes, that's correct. Um, Yeah, I mean, I guess it would be, so in the South, <laughs> whenever there is the threat of a snowflake, there is no milk or bread left in the store. Um, <laughs> this, is, um, this is kind of the thing that really shouldn't take place anymore. Um, it's, it's collective hoarding behavior. Um, it doesn't make really any sense because we almost never have, uh, snowstorms. We almost never have ice storms anymore, but in the last couple of years lately, now we do. So is that panic behavior based on the last couple of years? Maybe not so much anymore. Uh, when, in, I, I would say that in the, in the last couple of years, that might not be so much panic behavior, but prior to the last couple of years, it would have been. So 
I don't know if that's entirely helpful. It, 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 it definitely would have been an, a really good example from the last several years ago. Great. Kelly, here's a question here. Uh, this attendee would like to know, um, would you happen to have an example of applying CERC in a situation where fake news has permeated uh, public information with um, information, the unfolding event? Um, so just a situation where CERC can come into play during a fake news situation. Can you repeat the question? Sure. This individual would like to know if you have an example of how to apply CERC in a situation where there have been false stories that came out, um, so-called false stories that came out uh, that are different from what actually happened. Okay, so kind of like addressing rumors or myths. Yes. Um, yes, but that actually is another webinar in and of itself. So. Um, we are going to be doing a webinar on how to work with media and social media um, in another few months. So it's, it's kind of down the road a bit. Um, so I will answer that now, um, but do tune into that webinar because it'll get a little bit more detailed. And the, the simple answer to that is that you, you do and you don't address those situations. So there's really two litmus tests for when, for deciding when to address um, rumors or myths. In an emergency, so um, again, we're talking about addressing a rumor or a myth that is going to negatively impact the public's health. Okay, this is, this is communication that is going to influence the public's behavior that will impact how they make decisions that affect their health or safety in an emergency. And um, if that rumor is gaining any traction, if it's, um, if it's gaining in popularity, if people seem to be believing it, if um, it's being shared, um, and if it is um, going to cause harm. So if, if that information is promoting negative behaviors, if it's promoting negative actions, then it's worth addressing. However, the way that you address it is not to repeat it, is not to call it out and say, that's not true. It's to promote your message. It's to promote your positive action steps. Um, so again, that is a completely different webinar. Um, if you would like more information on that, please do email us at um, it's circrequest at cdc.gov or look on our website, um, which is um, on the CDC website, cdc.gov backslash circ. And our manual, uh, the chapter on how to deal with media, actually will tell you. But again, if you would like to just email us, I can point you in the right direction on, on that chapter. Fantastic, thanks Kelly. Mm -hmm. um, I have two things here, uh, not so much questions, just requests. Someone is asking if you can please uh, reiterate what CERC is, be first, be right, and they're not necessarily sure what the uh, the third attribute is there. Yeah. Um, okay. So the 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 introduction to CERC webinar that we did last time went over the six principles of CERC, and they are: be first, be right, be credible, which is we talked about trust. So be trustworthy, um, be honest. Um, the fourth one is express empathy. Five is promote action. And six is show respect. Thanks so much, Kelly. Um, one question here, how do you address denial? Um, again, repeating your message. Um, some of that is in your initial messaging, stating the facts, stating what you know, which is what happened. Um, often, 
at the very beginning of a response, that's all you know is what happened. And you're still getting, you're still getting information about what happened. You may not know what had happened. So um, getting, getting more information about the circumstance, getting more information about um, what's going on and just continuing to repeat your messaging. So that's eventually resonating with people. Great, thanks so much, Kelly. Um, one more question here, someone would like to know. What are the key points to helping children in a disaster situation or people with access to functional needs? Um, can CERC apply in this situation? And yeah, that's, that's basically the underlying question. The short answer is yes. Um, and the long answer is we tailor all of our messages to specific audiences. Um, uh, again, the, the next two webinars are about messages and audiences and community engagement. Um, we have an entire team when we are activated for a response at CDC dedicated to children's health. And um, I am happy to put you in touch with someone if you wanna speak to someone specifically about children's health, but we also, like I said, are working to get in, in touch with um, external organizations who can share our messages with populations that have, um, that have hearing um, challenges, that have, um, you know, translation challenges, that have mobility challenges. So all of these different audiences we consider and we try and reach out into the, into the community to make sure that they can share those messages. So, um, if, if it's all different types of organizations, that's how we do it. We try and build relationships with organizations that have access to those populations so they can share our messages. Um, uh, if you're wondering specifically how we do that, uh, I'm not entirely clear from the question because I'm not looking at the question, but um, if, if you're wondering specifically how we do that with children, we have an, an actual team that does that specifically. So um, it's, it's very well thought out and that's how we do it. We tailor all of our messages. And like I said, the next couple of webinars are specifically about how um, it's really important to consider making sure that your messages consider your audience. Great. Thanks so much, Kelly. We have a great question stating, can you please give an example of a time when traditions or past beliefs created a psychological barrier? Um, yes. <laughs> um, honestly, it's, it's been interesting with all kinds of different illnesses and vaccines, um, from, from flu to, um, to Ebola, um, and, and for, for different reasons, um, some have been religious, um, some have been, um, you know, you're saying current beliefs, some have been religious beliefs, some have been the belief that government is experimenting on, um, on indigenous populations that, that um, you know, we want to see the side effects and we want to see what it's going to do to live people before we take it into, you know, our populations. Um, uh, it, it, vaccines have always been a, a quarrelsome issue in that respect, where current beliefs in communities where, where, vac where new vaccines are being used have been controversial um, for different reasons. And, and belief systems um, and trust has been a huge um, barrier. Thanks so much, Kelly. Uh, another question here states, what is the best way to acknowledge uncertainty in an evolving situation without appearing like you don't have command over situational awareness? The way that we often, um, and, and this again, this gets back to um, the introduction to the CERC webinar, um, the way that we get around not knowing is by telling people what we're doing to get that information. So stating what we do know um, 
stating what we're in the process of learning, uh, you know, saying what information we're, we're looking to get, but also telling people how we're going about getting that information. Um, you know, we're working with our partners, naming our partners, if, if that's appropriate, um, to obtain certain information or to, to find out certain facts or to get certain data. Um, you know, you'll notice a lot of, of news coverage of certain, you know, um, certain activities that, that CDC is even involved in. You'll, you'll read stories and you'll see that a lot of, a lot of reports are, we're working with our partners at WHO, we're working with our partners at USAID to, to get data or to, you know, to, um, to compile reports. It's because that's what we're doing. It takes time to make sure that what we're sharing is accurate, but it is being done. It's, you know, hard work and it's time consuming work, but that doesn't mean nothing is being done. Um, so it's, it's sharing the process and it's making people part of the process and it's making people aware of the process. Um, and that is communicating. That is communicating, making people aware of how you're doing what you're doing is, is part of communicating. You know, it's, it's, it's still being transparent. Great. We have a question pertaining to this uh, webinar. It states, what are the seven mental states experienced in a crisis? What are the seven mental states? I believe the mental states that you previously mentioned um, in this webinar. Yeah. The ones that were the fear, denial, anxiety. Yeah. So what we talked about already because you guys are, um, if you are going for the CE credits, you guys will be tested on them. So you guys are, <laughs> <laughs> all right. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's what we discussed earlier. Um, fear, denial, um, anxiety, confusion, dread, hopelessness, and helplessness. Great. Thanks so much, Kelly. We actually have another request that we could probably fulfill at the end of this, but they would like you to redisplay the last slide uh, pertaining to preparation, initial maintenance, and they did not get the last category that you mentioned. In your oh, okay. Um, so let me try to share my screen again. Um, I know that it's not in presentation format, so just give me a second to make that happen. So you guys wanted to see the circ rhythm again, is that right? That is correct. Uh-oh, it didn't let me do it. Okay, so it's this one. Yeah, that's the one I'm on. Okay. Um, are you doing it? Okay, so um, Haley's going to do that for you guys. Um, is it share? Okay. So I think you guys should be looking at it now. I hope. Um, so that last, that last um, section should be resolution. Preparation, initial, maintenance, and resolution. And um, it's okay, I'm looking at it, I just want to make sure. Um, sorry, guys, we're sitting in the same room and I forget that I'm talking to you. Um, and um, this is the circ rhythm that goes throughout. So again, um, as part of the introduction to circ, we introduced this rhythm and it is something that, that I keep bringing back in every webinar because it's something that you have to consider in every webinar. So when we talk about psychology of a crisis, how people feel throughout an emergency from beginning to end changes, and then how people, uh, when we get to messages and audiences, how you write your messages and how you tailor them to your audiences changes throughout um, the rhythm. So this is just something you can want to keep in the back of your mind that that the rhythm is constantly changing and your communications 
are constantly changing. It would be lovely to say, okay, we've got a few messages and we're done. Um, that's not how it works. Circ is an ongoing, ever-evolving process. Um, and, and this used to be a five-step, five-phase process, but evaluation, you'll see at the top, has been moved to the top because it's something that you want to constantly be doing. You want to constantly be evaluating what you're doing so that you can address anything that needs to be changed so you can always be improving. Thank you so much. We are now at time. So we will go ahead and wrap up this webinar. I'd just like to thank everyone for attending and thank you so much for all of your questions. As a reminder, you can get continuing education credit for joining us today. Please follow the instructions online, which are also linked in the invitation you received. The course access code is CERC0605 with all letters capitalized. That's CERC 0605. Thank you again, and everyone have a good day.